This is an interview that I did with Jim Rooney. We recorded this at Cowboy Jack Clement's living room in Nashville. Jim Rooney has lived an amazing life, and he's been part of a lot of really cool things. One small part of his life was recording and producing people like Nancy Griffith, people like Towns Van Zandt, Billy Joe Shaver. I asked him if he would be nice enough to share some stories about his friendship with John Prine, and most notably about the time John Prine drove him through Paradise, Kentucky, and gave him a personal tour. And he was nice enough to play along. So sit back and imagine that you're in Cowboy Jack Clement's living room in Nashville, Tennessee, and enjoy the stories from Jim Rooney. When I look back on it now, he he was in a very productive period of his, his songwriting life. He'd been on major labels at this point, he, and for several years had been on um, the Electra and had big budgets to record and spent all that big budgets. And those that label deal was up, and his manager was looking for another big label deal. And meanwhile, Steve Goodman, who was John's best friend, had leukemia, and Steve didn't, and his deal was up too, but Steve realized he didn't have all the time in the world to wait for the next big record deal. So he decided to just start his own label called Red Pajamas. He had a very nice sense of humor about his illness because he was always in pajamas. We were riding around one day. He said, I think I'm going to start my own label too. I said, well, what are you going to call it? He said, oh boy. I said, no, what are you going to call it? Oh, I said, oh boy. Oh, oh, okay. Oh boy. And, and after Buddy Holly sort of tribute. And so, so we decided the very first thing we were going to do was, it was summertime and we recorded two Christmas songs because this is the way you do Christmas recordings. You do them in the summer and they come out in the winter. And um, we did Silver Bells and then we did I Saw Mama Kissing Santa Claus. John Prine loves Christmas. He has a Christmas tree up all year round at his house, as long as his wife will allow it, and very heavy into Christmas lights and the whole thing. So we we had a great lot of fun doing that recording. We got Rachel and her brother, we knew found out they could tap dance, so we recorded them tap dancing. And we got this wonderful piano player from the Grand Old Opry, Del Wood, very large, formidable woman. She had a big million seller of Down Yonder, down, dun, 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 like that. So we called her up and asked her to come in and play on it, and she did, you know. And uh, that was Oh Boy 001. It came out on red vinyl, 45. It's a real collector's item. Pic picture of John on Santa's knee, you know, on the cover. <laughs> there weren't a lot of people starting their own labels at this. No, no, no. He was way ahead of the pack, way ahead of it. And Why did he want to at that point? Well, at that time, uh, you know, it began to dawn on people that the money they were spending, these big budgets and the limos and the whole nine yards, you know, that was their money. It wasn't the record label's money. It The record label acted as if it was their money, but it wasn't. It was your money. And you owed them all that money. And you were never going to see any royalties, you know, that way. The only records of John's on a major label that made any money were the first ones on Atlantic. And they were very simple r records. And those were the songs that got him established, totally established, all the songs, Sam Stone, Hello in there, all those songs. Those are on the Atlantic recordings. But so when he went on his own, you know, we just started out very simply. We were making demos, basically, of these songs of his, but they're good songs, you know, and... Um, only Love, that's a song he wrote with Roger Cook and Sandy Mason, a beautiful song. Uh, and I wish I had a record label here to read the titles, but there, it's a, that became the first album. And then shortly after that, we did another one called German Afternoons, which is a strange title that none of us really understand why he calls it that, but that's up to him. And by that time... 
You know, he wrote Speed of the Sound of Loneliness, one of his very, very best songs. And um, he was just in a very good period of writing. And we were all just ready to play whenever he wanted to record. As I say, we were working on this, um, what became German Afternoons. Uh, you know, when you ask John about some, sometimes song titles or, or in this case, this album title, I said, where did that come from? He said, well, I made a list of potential titles and I showed it to my mother. And his mother was a wonderful, wonderful woman. And uh, she liked that one. And I, it might have had something to do with his army experience. He was stationed in Germany in the army. But we had another confirmation of it. There was a good German restaurant here in town called the Gerst House. And occasionally, John and I would wind up over there in the afternoon, and they had these big, what called fish bowls of beer, good beer. And we were in there one afternoon and went in around 2 and came out around 5. And I said, I guess that was a German afternoon. <laughs> You know, and, uh, you know, it's it's just stupid stuff like that. But anyway, we were working on that album, and the cover, we spent quite a bit of time on the cover photograph. This wonderful photographer, Jim McGuire, who's well known for all of his work here in Nashville for the last 40 or 50 years, taking pictures of all the people that make the music here. He was taking pictures. We set up... A, if you look at the album cover, it, it, you don't know what this is about. It, there's a refrigerator. John's sitting on a chair looking into a refrigerator door open that has a light in it while getting this set up out on a hill with the sun set behind him. I mean, setting this thing up was a piece of work. We had to take the, uh, get a truck to bring the refrigerator up there and... Is this John's idea? I don't know whose idea this was, but somebody's <laughs> idea. At any rate, we we got that far with it, and then some point, and we re, we re-recorded re Paradise for this album, and it was in more of a little bluegrassy flavored treatment of it. I had parts of the Nashville bluegrass band played Stuart Duncan and Alan O'Brien on it, and um, had a really good feel for it, and. Uh, that song Paradise, of course, is, you know, one of John's best known songs. And so he said, you know, do you want to, we were still, we, we hadn't decided on album cover. We were still taking pictures and things and thinking about it. And so he said, let's go up to Paradise. You know, he said, let's go up to Central City. This area of Kentucky is one of these musical hot spots in America that just looks like nothing when you go there. This is the home of Merle Travis, Ike Everly of the Everly Brothers' father, the Prine family, uh, Bill Monroe not too far away. Yeah, it, so it's quite a, got that vibe about it musically. So we went up there and John's, I think it's a 49, Ford coupe, red, that he'd had totally restored. Three of us, me and McGuire and, and John. And um, so we pull into the Rambling Rose Motel there and get in a room, our rooms and whatnot, and we're in John's room. And he's got some vodka and we're having a drink. And around one in the morning, he says, well, would you fellows like to go to paradise? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course we would. So we got in the car, and it was wintertime, and it was dark, of course. I mean, we're driving along, and he's pointing out there's a, on our left, we could see this dark, there's trees there. He said, well, there's just a skin of trees to hide the, the strip mining, you know, so any rate, and we finally come around a corner and there's a lot big light, big, big power plant there, coal power plant, and piles, mountains of coal, and all lit up, of course, and lots of signs, no and a big sign saying paradise 
power plant. This is Paradise, Kentucky. This is this was a village right there, and it's on the Green River. We and then we John went past those no trespassing, no entry signs. We drove down this very rutted, it had been muddy and now it was frozen, ruts, uh, down to the Green River where Paradise lay. And this is where his, his parents came from. And what happened, and later on I rode around that area with John and his mother, and she said what they did was come into a village like that, the coal company. They wanted to get rid of these people and so they could strip mine. And so the deal was they would go see the oldest people in the village. These are little shotgun houses, little wooden shotgun, probably three-room houses, you know, very simple, and offer them $5,000. And that's the only money these people were ever going to see in their life. And the other people didn't feel it was their role to stand in their way. So they would pick off the older people and the younger people eventually got the picture. And that's when the Prines moved to Chicago. And that's when everybody in that area moved somewhere as part of the great migration that, you know, Bill Monroe and his brothers, they went up to Gary, Indiana. Uh, and so, um, so then, so we were down by the Green River, you know, where paradise lay, the song, and um, and we hear the sirens going off, whoop, 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 like that, you know, and the and we see a big suburban, you know, big Chevy suburban coming our way. <clears throat> we get back. McGuire's taking pictures all the time, and we get back in the car. And we started heading back, and they're heading towards us. And we come abreast, and John rolls his window down. They got their window down. He just says, I was just showing my friends here from Nashville where things used to be, and rolled up the window, and off they, we drove. <laughs> In this 49 red Ford coupe. And it was twilight zone all the way, you know, totally twilight zone. I'm not sure those guys were wondering, what is this about? <laughs> but, but it didn't work. And now, you know, and the line is the world's largest shovel, you know, and came in there and they tortured the timber and whatever, did all the land and, and rode it all down to the progress of man. Well, that world's largest shovel, very beautifully dug its own grave. They couldn't get it out. <laughs> it's still down there, and they covered it up. And people go there every year and stand around and sing Paradise. <laughs> Isn't that something? That was the great Jim Rooney telling stories about his friendship with John Prine. You saw a book sitting next to the tape recorder. That's Jim's book, and I highly recommend you go pick up a copy. It's a great read, and he's had an amazing life. But thank you guys very much, and I will talk to you soon. Much love to you.